Hi everyone, my name is Zach McLean and today we are super excited to be joined by a bona fide house music legend. We're going to talk about his career, his approach to DJing and of course his famous remixes and his brand new compilation coming out soon, Strictly Roger Sanchez. Welcome to Pump Bank. Thank you. How's it going? Good, good. So before we get into all the modern stuff and uh, DJing and your approach uh, on that kind of thing, I wanted to ask you about the very beginnings in New York City. Um, we were just talking about before we went on air about MPC 60 or SP 1200. Yeah. Which camp did you fall into? For me, I started off originally with the SP 12. Ah, yes. And then you know graduated to an SP 1200, and I never really got into the MPC. Some friends of mine, which were more hip hop oriented, went into that. For some reason, house music kind of led me more towards the SP 1200 yeah. route. I was able, and I became able to create an entire track with about 10 or 15 seconds worth the sample <laughs> time. Back then, I mean, it wasn't much back then, but it just seemed like you could do so much with it. Now you look at it and it's like 10 seconds of sample time. How do they get anything but a kick and a clap out of it? But, you know, that was the beauty of it. You used anything that you had. You used the facilities to the maximum to get the most out of it. Did you ever crave that simplicity again? You know, with all the options we have now, we're just going back to having 10 to 12 seconds of sample time, a floppy disk with X amount of space on it. It's interesting. It's like if you're an athlete, then all of a sudden you decide to go back and take the Spartan challenge. <laughs> you know, there are times when I force myself to try to strip it completely back to a very narrow bandwidth of, of uh, instruments or of sounds to see how creative I can get because that's how I used to create. And there are times when I just get happy and use every single plug-in I possibly can. What I find is that if you can become proficient and very creative with a small amount of material, with a very you know limited synths, limited sounds, that's when you allow your creativity to take over. And that's what helps you create really good songs, really good tracks. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of an influence did the MIC culture at the time have on your DJing and production? I mean, what was that scene like? Can you give us a, an insight into how exciting it might have been? Well, when I first started DJing, I was very young. I was like 13 years old. And back then, it was all about breakdancing, graffiti, early hip hop, disco, mixed with funk. We used to cut you know, breaks of one track back and forth just to extend it and create, basically, a track out of just a break of a, of a drum beat or something like that. So it was very much DIY, but the whole scene, the breakdancing scene, the graffiti scene, everything really fed into the creation of the music. It's like the backdrop of it. So the conditions living in New York, the communities, it all became part of the elements that went into creating the tracks. And in terms of remixing, I mean, how did you first start remixing and, and what's your approach to remixing in general? Well, when I first started, it was interesting because I was a Billboard reporting DJ, which meant Billboard magazine had a dance chart. And I was one of the DJs of about 100 DJs across the country that would submit a chart every single week and that would create, that would make up the dance chart. And what started happening is I started making a lot of contacts with the labels. And that's about the time when I had my record Love Dancing out, which was pretty much the first big release. I'd only had one other release prior to that. From that record, I started getting all the offers from these different labels. Hey, I want you to remix this record. I like what you did with Love Dancing. And they would send me multi-tracks. I mean, these are like two-inch tapes, which you don't see nowadays, with all the instruments. And back then, it was whatever tempo the track was, you had to take that and create something new. So my approach back then was I would say, okay, let me see what elements that I could take from this record to still preserve the initial idea that the artist that created the song, so I gave them the respect of that, but try to adapt it to my size and to my sound. And then I would strip it out, reproduce, do new beats, new bass lines, new chords, but try to follow along with the overall vibe that I felt from them. So it's, it was a respectful way of, of remixing, at least that's the way it was at first. Then later on, I was like, you know what, rip these things apart. And just because you can now. Just because yeah. I can. And the thing is, the more I did it, the more people would ask me to do that. They, right. And it became so prevalent that at one point in time, the remixes that I would do would become the actual um, main versions. It happened yeah. when I remixed um, Incognito with Giving It Up. The remix... Bluey was so impressed by the remix, he said, I want to make that my main version. So that was, you know, very, very cool. Back then, it was kind of like a 12-inch 
culture as well where some people wouldn't always put their names in a remix. The label would just get people like Dave Morales and things yeah. like that to just mix it. Did you have that as well at the time? I started getting more remixes based on the work that I had done originally, all my original work, the things that I released on labels like Strictly Rhythm. So they wanted the name. So I would do a version that was a lot more respectful and then I would do another version which became my alter ego, which is where the S-Man thing yeah. came from just to kind of give a completely different take on it and take it further into the underground. And that's when I started getting the request, okay, so do two mixes. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Do> <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just made double the work for myself. <laughs> but, you know, it allowed me to be more expressive. Yeah, I and mean, I wanted to ask you about your aliases because that's a big part of your career. I mean, you've had quite a few aliases uh, throughout the years. So, I mean, why, why do you feel the need to make music under different names? Is it like a liberating thing for you? When I first came out and started doing my records, I came up with these kind of monikers to describe a sound. So if something would be a lot deeper, then I would come up with a particular name for it. The other thing that was behind it as well was, at that point in time, the labels are trying to sign artists. So it was my ability to have the freedom to work with different labels meant that I would create a project, sign that project to that label, which means that label had, let's say, Underground Solution um, or whatever, Nice Guy Soul Man. And whatever fit into that sound, I would release with that label. And they would not only serve the, dual, the duty of giving a particular vibe to the name, a particular sound, yeah. But it also allowed me to say, okay, well, this one goes with this label, which I think is the right place for that one. This one goes to this label, which I think is the right place for that one. And the interesting thing was that I would find myself sometimes fighting with myself within the middle of a, of a production. I'd be starting off a record as a Roger Sanchez, and all of a sudden it started going really underground. I'm like, okay, stop. Let me take this production, set it aside, go back, retrace my steps, and take that on that journey, and then come back to this one and create a, a secondary production that would be the al the alter ego version. But I wound up over time being able to identify each moniker with a particular aspect of my production. So I would try to narrow the field and, and just kind of be true to whatever it is I was doing yeah. and, and create that track based on that vibe. Well, that's really interesting about that idea is that you were so prolific. I mean, a lot of the, the problems that producers who are established and newer producers have is finishing music. Is, is start, they start something, they get a beat going, and then they don't know how to take it somewhere, but you were in the process of making two or three versions of the same remix. I mean, how do you do it? <laughs> Tell One, us. It, this is the interesting thing. When I first started producing records, it was literally just to have fun, create a beat that nobody had, play it in the club. And because I, I only had rudimentary knowledge of, of how to operate things, I had a friend of mine that was in the studio kind of guiding me along and helping me along in the beginning, and then I started learning along the way. Um, and I had to pay for studio time. Ah, there this is. is the interesting thing. <laughs> when you have a limited budget and you have 12 hours and you have to pay X amount of money, you're going to finish that track. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to sit there and at some point in time, you go, you know what, that sounds good, move on, next thing, move on, move on, move on. And that practice, that discipline, help me to learn how to make decisions. And this is what I find a lot of producers nowadays have a problem with. It's over sensory overload. There's so many different tracks that are out there, so many different influences, different ideas, that it's hard sometimes to pick, and this happened to me, it's like, okay, where do I go with this? I need to pick a lane. I wanna do something more underground. I wanna do some techno. Somewhere along the way, an idea came in that's a lot funkier, more disco. Now I start going another direction. That's where people started losing the thread. Mm -hmm. And I found that back in the day, when I had a limited amount of time, I had to pick a direction, run with it. Because in about two more hours, that's it. Now you gotta pay another day, another lockout, and then you know the tracks don't become cost effective. So for me, that's how I learned to finish tracks. And now I, I apply the same mentality, even though I, I have my own studio, but I apply that mentality of see it through, get it done come up with ideas quickly, mm -hmm. quickly sketch them out, and then <clears throat> you can go back and rework sounds. In terms of your studio, you mentioned hiring out bigger studios and also using the SP-12. I mean, when did you start moving inside the box? When did you start thinking, okay, the computers and um, dolls are the way forward? In the beginning, in the beginning. <laughs> um, in the beginning, it was, I started off in a box. I started off um, trying to get as much out of the SP-1200 um, 
that, like I said, you know, first the SP-12 in the friend's studio, and then it was um, a CZ-101 keyboard, then a Juno 106. So everything was outboard. All the sounds, you had to go to a specific, you know, keyboard or, or synth rack or something. And then I started creating these tracks that were based solely in the SP-1200. So it was samples. I would sample a bass line note and replay it. And that kind of helped me focus in the box. Then I started adding all the external pieces to it. And over the years, that's how I wound up building my own studio. I would see what I like in a studio that I would rent out, and I would say, okay, I want to go buy that unit, I'll go buy that unit. As I got more and more into the computer, all these synths that I'd spent a fortune on just started coming up as plugins. And it was a lot easier because then I moved from a desktop to my laptop because my touring schedule became impossible. I started seeing my output tail off, so I kind of had to find a solution to that. That's when I started working a lot more in the box. I started getting all the synths that I loved, finding the plug-in versions of it, and finding these other plugins that would like, let's say, tube amplifiers that would emulate tube tech and warm it up. Mm -hmm. And that's how I kind of was able to recreate my sound, but do it in the box. And what are your go-to things now for things like drums production? You know, the interesting thing is I still have this drive that I just love just stealing kicks and snares from <laughs> any single place I could find because it forces me to not do the same thing over and over again. So I will literally troll through all my tracks and just go through. Sometimes I find the breath between a snare and another snare, and I like the sound of that, and I'll layer that on a snare sound. And I have like six terabytes of different synths and sounds and and samples that I've collected over the years, plus kits that I get from every place. I just force myself to take time. One hour is going to be just to go through sounds. And your go-to setup right now is live rewired it, Logic. Right? It's Logic, and then I rewire Ableton Live <clears throat> through it. And the reason I do that is I've found the ability to create beats in live is so much faster, so much easier, the way the it locks loops right on beat, and then the ability to just really cut and move things around and, and arrange is very, very fast on Ableton. However, what I find is I have a lot more proficiency at actual keyboard work and recording vocals and logic, and I like the sound of logic better, so I'll create my loops in Ableton and it's great for auditioning sounds and effects, you know, because mm -hmm. it's just that straightforward. And then I'll just do the kind of sketch of the beat arrangement as I go along, and then I'll bounce the stems out. And then from there, once I have my drums set, then I'll continue working in Logic. Yeah, and do you have any other go-to plugs that you always find yourself sticking on trucks? The uh, Sub Boom Bass is one of my favorite Rob ones. Papen, I yeah. love the Rob, the Rob. Rob Papen has one of my favorite sounds. Like Also, in terms of reverbs, I always use the RP verb. That's like my go-to reverb. The SPL Bass Ranger is something that I use on my kicks and my bass lines to kind of fatten them up. Waves, I always use the Ultra Maximizer to get the most out of not even just as an overall mastering tool, but I'll use it on certain sounds just to get the right sizing. And then I also use um, Isotope, the imager, just mm -hmm. to get that really big stereo sound on pads and, and sometimes on background vocals. So those are kind of like my go-tos that I, that I use. I, they're always in my, in my main rack. And in terms of DJ, I mean, DJing culture uh, and technology has changed drastically since you started. Yeah. I mean, how have you found your personal experience with DJing evolve over time? Well, when I first started, it was just like everybody, you know, I had the Gemini mixer and two turntables. The Technics 100, they were belt driven with a dial. So the interesting thing is it was incredibly hard to keep a beat using a dial. Yeah. And <laughs> it's funny, I find that the more challenging the technology is, if you learn how to master it, the next iteration becomes that much easier. So I went from two turntables, once I got the, the Techniques 1200s, and I graduated to three techniques, and I was able to play on three decks at the same time, and that was kind of like my thing. I had hip-hop techniques, because when I first started, you know, I was mixing hip-hop with disco and funk, so a lot of cutting and scratching. And then the blending part of the mixing part started happening more coming out of disco and when house music, which had much steadier beats that you could actually kind of mix in. Then I started mixing in that third turntable, then acapella, whatever it is. From there, I got involved very early on with Pioneer when they started developing the CD format. And 
from the very beginning of Pioneer till now, I've been involved with different iterations and I've seen how the technology has progressed to the point where now it not only does everything that a techniques does, but it goes beyond that with looping and I've expanded my setup to include four decks and I literally use four decks. It'll be loops on one and acapella another one. I'll bring in the track on another one. I've gone from playing records to doing live remixes on the spot. So every single set is unique. And how much prep do you have to put into that kind of set or is it all on the fly? It's a combination of the preparation allows you to find things faster. I'm very organized. When I do my playlists, I tend to break things down according to the genre and then vocals and tracks because I play a lot of vocals. Let's say it'll be deep or I may have one since I have two different you know monikers. I have Roger Sanchez vocals and, and then I have S-Man vocals and S-Man tracks, tech, uh, deep. And then I'll create loops and I'll create banks of loops and they could be everything from beats to vocals to bass lines to whatever. And it's having like a preset construction kit. And as I'm playing, I'm vibing with the crowd and then it'll come to mind, hey, I've got this vocal loop I could throw in here. I've got this beat that this track is kind of cool, but it doesn't move the way I want it to. So I'll filter out the bottom end and bring in this other track that's got a bigger beat and just maybe more jack and vibe mm -hmm. to add more dynamic and drama. And it creates unavailable versions because the funniest thing I get is people go, oh, dude, what was that version of this track you played? I'm like, it's the I just did it right now in front of your face mix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the crowds, I mean, because the, the places where the DJs buy their records now are also available to the public worldwide. In the past, there might have been a record store in the corner of a block in New York City or in Chicago that everyone went to and it was very specific. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that ch change in the crowd happen? It's interesting because now everything is on display, not just the records that I play um, in terms of what's available on Beatport and so on and so forth, but just the sets themselves. Like now, every set that I play, somebody's gonna record something. So it's good and it's bad. It's bad for DJs that are lazy and they wanna play the same set because you're gonna see that repeated online everywhere and that shows you the work you're not doing. For me, it keeps me on my toes. The crowds are far more informed, but then again, for me, as I said, I tend to remix things on the spot. So I find that each one is more of an experience set mm -hmm. rather than saying, oh, he played the hottest records right now. I'll never know what I'm going to play before I get on that stage. I have a couple of tracks that I know I'm gonna to wanna to play, but my set is really informed by my interaction with the crowd. What I love is the fact that they're more, at least on a global scale, they're much more involved in the scene. A lot more people now understand the music, they'll know certain tracks, they'll even request certain tracks, but they're there for the music in general. So you can do things that are different and you could bring your own elements to it. That's why my live remixing works for me because I'll create a new experience of a track that they might know. I may take a classic acapella, say, Old Trinity Free, and layer it with a completely different track, and you have a, a new experience. And there is a bit of a, a renaissance in house music at the moment. How do you feel about people who might not even have been alive when you were doing it the first time, now making classic house records? It's interesting for me that that sound, because you see, everything is cyclical. Everything comes back around. That just proved it to me. What I was doing literally 20 years ago has just come back and it's like a fresh new thing. It's really good for me, like with what I'm doing right now with my Strictly Roger Sanchez compilation, to dig some of the tracks out from the past and it's kind of like they're brand new again because they haven't been heard by this generation, but they've been influenced by it. Mm -hmm without them even knowing it. I was putting that compilation together. I mean, it must have been some hard choices you had to cut out. You, you know what the funny thing a lot was? Of tracks to pick from. <laughs> this, this is, here's where my kind of like OCD-ish came into really rescuing me. What I try to do with this one, because I've done other compilations in the past of Best Of Roger Sanchez, we really try to go in, and I say we because it was definitely a concerted effort with with Defected with Simon Dunmore, and he and I kind of bounce some ideas back and forth, but I try to go for the non-obvious tracks and the forgotten, more obscure tracks. What we found is a lot of the masters are not available anymore, but I have literally about 95% of all of the records I've ever done on DATs, and I have one functioning DAT machine, which is the digital audio tape 
And I was able to literally go in and bounce down these masters that were basically in, I've got a, a steel box case with all of my dats and I've just gone through them. There's some that I could, that I couldn't find. So there are some tracks that I would love to be able to bring out and then I just don't know where the hell they are. <laughs> and the labels themselves don't even have it. But by and large, I had that massive collection of, of dats and I was able to pull a lot of tracks and there's some good surprises on it. Just to finish up, I mean, what would be your piece of advice for anyone who's just starting out as a DJ and producer now? I think the best thing I could advise people to do is really fall in love with music, do the research to create your own interpretation of it. So you could take influences from different artists and DJs, but you should filter it in your own way. And that's what's going to set you apart and to really be diligent because this is like anything that it's like painting. It's like, you know, playing any instrument. You have to dedicate time to this in order to perfect your craft. Cool. Nice one, Mama. Thanks for Thank coming you. in. Thanks for having me.